Um, hello. Could you check that this can be heard on YouTube? Audio test. Audio test. Audio test. Hmm. Hello? Oh, I... Can you now hear things? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it works. I Um, what happens if I make you host now? Can I still s make host? I'm still sharing, right? Yes. Could you check it's still working for YouTube? The YouTube's like way behind. That's fine. Hello. Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, Hello. You are muted. Uh, two seconds, my audio. Hello. Hello. We're just doing tech. <laughs> Yeah, I see. Yeah, I, I, you can see me adequately. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, we are in the same room, actually. We I see. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Right. So, for the Zoom. Yeah, this is that's just uh, oh, that. uh, probably I might need to put the blinds down, I guess, to get better. Yeah. Help. yeah, so that works. Oops. Oh, ah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> It looks odd, but yes. That's because I had something open there. Oh, I see. Um, and you wanted me to um, move the slides over. Is that correct? <laughs> Hey. Um, hello, Tony. Hello. Hello. Possibly not do this because I'm getting echo. I can tell me. Uh, yeah. Now you'll probably be getting echo if you speak, but yeah. Um, I'm muted. Yeah. Okay. okay. But you can hear me, Tony. I can. Yes. Yes. Amazing. Lovely to um, lovely to see you. Um, in well, as much as um, meet you as much as you can meet anyone in these times. Yeah, um, 
you wanted me to move the slideshow about. Is that yes, correct? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Yes. I, I have trouble doing it from here. Yes. That is just fine. Um, you should now be able to uh, to see the slides. Um, yes, I, I can. To, yes. How do you want to indicate that I should move forward? Are you just going to sell? Yeah, I'll just tell you. I think. Yes. Next. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Mm. How is um? So, a, a brief. You may have to go to the other side because it's going to give me a headache. Maybe. Yeah. Um. Okay. We'll just move over. Um. So, um, how things are going to work is that we have um, um, we have both the Zoom call, and we have um, we are sharing a version of it where. People cannot um, cannot interact, cannot unmute themselves, cannot come in and um, what's it called and say anything. Um, and the reason we have both of those is because um, we have members from uh, members from the Cambridge University Physics Society are part of a mailing list where oh, we yes. send out the links to this Zoom, um, um, and then the ones that we cannot people cannot interact with we put out on the internet for so a lot of lot of the Cambridge University Physics Society also just uses that link but um, the reason we have that is so we don't have strangers coming in and sure. uh, and disrupting yeah. things so if you sure. don't see a lot of people here do not worry <laughs> no no sir. but there will presumably be um, uh, opportunity um, at the end for a short um, question and answer yeah session. Yes. Would you prefer that we keep all the questions to the end, or would you like the questions to be um, to be given like continuously throughout? Or I think I prefer them. At, I think I prefer them at the end, actually. Okay. Um, usually, what happens is people write down the questions, and <laughs> yes. I will take a lock of the questions, and then kind of select um, uh, the ones I think are most interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, and sure. read them out loud. Yes, sure. Okay, sounds good. Amazing. Um, I mean, if you are ready, then I think we can let people in. Could you make the YouTube thing uh, public as well? I will once I work out how to. Yeah, let me let me just. Um, oh. <laughs> Oh, just remind me um, how long uh, roughly I'm supposed to take. Roughly an hour. With the yes. online thing, it's not a bother if it's only approximately. Yes, it's probably. It. Yeah, so. I, um, I, I suspect it'll be less than an hour, if anything. But that'll leave That's time for. That's completely fine. That's yes. completely fine. We we tend to get um, we tend to get a quite a decent selection of uh, of questions as well. So um, usually we overrun by by quite a bit, as you tend to do yes. in these sorts of public seminars. How have you been? I should ask. Um, it's it's been a while since we last talked. Um, I think last I heard from you was around Easter, uh, when you were talking about going to an arboreum with your family or something <laughs> like that. Yes, uh, well, I did indeed go, I think probably the day after I um, emailed you, and yes. uh, the rather peculiar appearance of my face is the result of that trip, unfortunately, oh, because um, I, I, uh, um, I somehow, I think, managed to trip over on a concrete walkway. Oh, and my God. For a couple of weeks after that, I really looked like something out of a horror movie. So I couldn't, I simply couldn't uh, afford to go on Zoom at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, a... now it's uh, sort of recovered, but <laughs> you still see the, uh, some traces of it. Yeah, I, I can see. That's really unfortunate. I'm really sorry. It was outside <laughs> of that uh, major incident. How was, was, it, was it all right? Oh, Were yes. The... Yeah, no, yes, actually, the flowers were very good. <laughs> Yeah. That is really good to hear. Um, that is really good to hear. Um, here in, um, I mean, 
here in uh, Cambridge, the weather's taken a bit of a turn for the worse since uh, since Easter. So now it's getting cold like uh, winter again, which is very, very it. disappointing. Um, yeah. But we, we had a good week or so with, with really nice warm weather with, with tons of walk opportunities and things like that. Um, so how far, sorry, so go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So I was going to ask, how far are people actually um, at the university in person, as distinct from... Uh, so, almost the vast, vast majority of teaching is online. Um, uh, I think uh, with the exception of some practical courses like medicine, um, yes. uh, as well as I think some experiment, the experimental section of... Um, of uh, a few courses, I don't know which one in particular, maybe chemistry and things like that, have gone back to in person, but everything else is online. Um, oh. And for the physics tripods, the only things that will be in person in this year will be the examinations, in fact, um, oh, yeah. which is yeah. very unfortunate, um, yes. which are gonna, which are gonna happen um, in about, um, what, in about three weeks, they will start for the third year students. Uh, which uh, both Alma and I are. Um, and yeah, Alma, may I ask, how is, uh, have people found the YouTube link? 23 watching. 23 watching, okay. Um, could you possibly post the YouTube link on, um, on the Facebook? Um, on the events? Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, and I think we'll wait about five, five minutes. Um, sure, yes, for yes. People to turn up. People tend to be just, just a bit late for these sorts of things. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you, you know the feeling. Um, have you had to do a lot of Zoom meetings? Um, um, quite a few, to be honest. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, most of them have tended to be, uh, as this one is, intercontinental. Yes. Oh, I've, yeah. had, I've had quite a few talks to it with, uh, given a few, few talks with India and a couple with China and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. Under the discussion for the talk? Yeah. Cool. Um, I see, I see. Oh, I guess everyone is taking advantage of the fact that uh, we can get such an esteemed, they can get such an esteemed speaker without having to, uh, <laughs> to arrange for the flights and arrange for, for everything that uh, that entails, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, in some some ways, it does make life easier, actually. It does. <laughs> I was, I was, um, so I was considering um, for next year when I need to start applying for PhDs. That uh, oh, yeah. of course it's going to be less. You less going to be able to visit the places that you most want to go, but it might yes. be easier to yes. get opportunity to meet people uh, you would like yeah. to uh, be supervised by. Um, yes. So how how the practicalities of um, this will work is that um, in um, in just a minute or two um, I will uh, give some basic information, notably uh, mentioning that um, this society works on like an annual basis where the committee changes, and uh, I'm the outgoing committee chair and Alma, or one of the two outgoing chairs, I think we have Wojtek um, in this meeting as well, who's the other one. Um, and then we have a new incoming committee who Alma is a part of. Um, oh. I'll just briefly mention that. Um, then I'll give you a short introduction um, and thank the sponsors of the Cambridge University Physics Society. Uh, so okay. they are happy and will hopefully continue to uh, give us money for yes, snacks and uh, yes. things like that. Very good, yes. yes. Um, and then after that, uh, I will leave it up to you. And okay. you can get started. Okay. So we have about 50 people uh, in attendance now. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how Hyde climbs. Uh, but with that out of the way, I think I will start giving the introduction. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the very final talk 
of this committee of the Cambridge University Physics Society. Uh, that is to say the 2020-2021 uh, 20, 20, 20, committee. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to, uh, to host all of these events along with uh, what limited social events were possible during the year of COVID. Uh, and we're extremely happy uh, with how many people have uh, been able to attend these talks, both from the Cambridge University Physics Society, but also um, the many people who have found our events uh, through uh, unorthodox means um, from all over the world who've come to join us. Uh, today, we are joined by the esteemed uh, Anthony Leggett, um, who is the 2003 Nobel Prize winner, particularly um, you won it for your work on superfluids, specifically helium-3, um, which is quite different from uh, the uh, standard superfluid theory of helium-4. Um, Anthony Leggett uh, is currently a Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and um, he grew up and uh, attended university over here in the United Kingdom, not at Cambridge, but rather at Oxford, uh, from what I can read. Um, um, he was born in London and attended the University of Oxford, both for his undergraduate studies as well as his graduate studies. Over his career, he's held positions at the University of Sussex, at Waterloo and at Urbana-Champaign. In addition to the Nobel Prize, um, he's also won numerous awards, including the Maxwell Medal and Prize, uh, the Paul Dirac Medal, uh, the Wolf Prize in Physics, and additionally, he's also a, mem a fellow of the Royal Society, and you have been awarded a KBE in 2004, uh, following the Nobel Prize in 2003. Um, today, you, Tony, uh, or Anthony, will be speaking on what we can do with a quantum liquid. Before I hand uh, it over to him, I should just like to say that here at the Cambridge University Physics Society, we are extremely proud to be sponsored by Seamless, River Lane, TTP, TPP, Define, Jane Street, and CGG. Uh, Anthony has expressed that he would prefer questions at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat at any time, and I will keep a log um, and make sure that um, and that we remember them at the end of the talk. Thank you very much for attending, and I will hand it over to you, Tony. Okay. Okay, well, good evening. Um, if you were to plot the um, temperature uh, on a the ordinary centigrade or Fahrenheit uh, scale, it would look something like this. Yes, yes, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, you see that uh, you have a, um, a region of normal human experience, which roughly speaking goes from the bottom uh, to, uh, along the width of this red line on either the right or the left. It doesn't matter very much which it is. Um, and you see various everyday experiences like water freezing and the coldest winter in Champaign-Urbana, my, my hometown, uh, on that uh, graph. If we think about some of the things I'm going to be talking about in this talk, uh, we have to go down quite a long way towards the bottom of, of the picture. You see that liquid nitrogen boils about 100 degrees. Um, Superconductivity, at least until it was known until quite recently, uh, only occurs below about um, uh, 50 degrees at most. And liquid helium, one of the uh, uh, things I'm going to be talking about, boils only um, about four uh, degrees. And in fact, most of the uh, effects which I'm going to be talking about occur so close to zero on that graph, that zero on the uh, Kelvin scale, that uh, it, it'd be impossible for you to distinguish them, the temperatures from zero. However, that's really rather misleading 
it becomes a lot more sensible if we start to plot things not on a linear scale as you're, you're used to doing but rather on a logarithmic scale next slide please uh, sorry next one after that <laughs> yeah um so uh if we plot things on a, a logarithmic scale you see you see things get uh, spread out much more conventional superconductivity occurs right at the top of the graph liquid helium-4 becomes superfluid, a little below. Then liquid helium-3 becomes superfluid at about two thousandths of a degree absolute. The lowest temperature achieved in bulk solids um, uh, comes somewhere like this, um, as the blue arrow, around um, about uh, one um, about a hundred thousandths uh, of a degree. You get Bose condensation and the alkali gases. Um, uh, uh, then the lowest temperature achieved in atomic matter. And finally, the lowest temperature achieved in a nuclear spin system. And so you see that um, I've, I've actually plotted the, in green the dates at which these um, temperatures were achieved. And you'll see in particular that since about 1960, there has been enormous advance in this. In fact, if you think in terms of um, decades, the number of decades which we've been able to advance in lowering the temperature has, I believe, much exceeded the number of decades which the high energy physicists have managed to achieve in going to higher and higher energies. Uh, if you plot the advances in, uh, as um, uh, uh, de decibels per dollar or pound, the, the progress is even more spectacular because to go down one decibel, one decade in low temperature physics is a lot cheaper than going up a decade in elementary particle physics. So in that respect, I think um, uh, advances in low temperature physics are really very cheap compared to most other things. Well, um, why do we bother? Why should we uh, try to go to lower and lower temperatures? Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons is the uh, topic of this talk, which is uh, quantum liquids. And to get a quantum liquid, it turns out, you know, we need uh, three ingredients, which I will uh, discuss in turn in this and the next few slides. Um, first of all, we need low temperatures to give us a high degree of order. We need quantum mechanics to ensure that the things we normally think about as particles begin to show wave behavior. And we need a liquid so that particles can change places. And that last um, uh, that last condition is often not very much emphasized, but it's actually very important. If you combine all these three properties, then you may get what we call a quantum liquid. And quantum liquids, one, one way of defining them is that they not only show the effects of quantum mechanics, but also the effects of the characteristic indistinguishability of elementary particles. And I'll, I'll discuss that in more detail in a minute. One particularly interesting class of quantum liquids is so-called superfluids. And these are quantum liquids which show macroscopic quantum behavior. Um, so now let's look at each of these conditions uh, these ing ingredients in turn. Our next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I said, generally, you can say rather generally, uh, by going to lower temperatures, you increase the degree of order. And on this slide, I've actually th shown three examples of that. If you have a collection of atoms or molecules, um, for example, water molecules, then at high temperatures, uh, they may be liquid. The atoms are just disposed at random and moreover, they're uh, moving about all the time. If on the other hand, you can cool that your uh, liquid to, uh, to low temperatures, 
then you've got to get a solid, for example, ice. Um, in that solid, the atoms are uh, fixed in definite positions relative to one another, and they don't move around or change places. Similarly, if I have a series, a set of um, little magnets or little, uh, spins, for example, the spins carried by electrons in a metal, um, then at, at high temperatures, uh, they will be in a so-called paramagnetic phase in which the spins or magnets are oriented completely at random. In the low temperature phase, uh, if you go to low temperatures, you may go over to a ferromagnetic phase in which, crudely speaking, the spins all line up with one, one another, as on the right-hand side. Finally, if I have a collection of two uh, kinds of atoms of different types, say, for example, copper and zinc, then at high uh, temperatures, they uh, may well form a disordered alloy, as on the left, you see that um, there is no particular preference for a red to be next to a blue or vice versa. At low temperatures, we get an ordered alloy where the uh, every uh, red is surrounded in this diagram by four, in three dimensions, actually six blues and vice versa. So rather generally, we can expect that if we go to lower temperatures, we do, in a very generic sense, increase the degree of order. Next slide, please. The next ingredient you might remember was quantum mechanics. And a basic feature of quantum mechanics is that things we normally thought about as particles turn out to behave, at least under certain circumstances, as waves. Take an example. Suppose we have a, a, a glowing filament which is emitting electrons. And so there's actually quite a bit of technology which I haven't shown in this diagram. We need to, to uh, co uh, collimate and monochromate these electrons. But suppose we've done that, and we then let, the, let them fall on an opaque screen which has two slits in it. Now, if we were not talking about um, e electrons, but about, say, about light, um, then, as you know from your high school labs, if you do an experiment like that and you have a nicely collimated and monochromated beam of light, say from some kind of sodium arc lamp, and you shine it on a, a screen with two slits that, like that, then if you've done the experiment properly, you should get on the photographic plate um, at the right a pattern of dark and bright lines. And um, that's usually taken as uh, convincing evidence that light is indeed a wave. However, nowadays, it's rather easy to do this kind of experiment also with electrons, and in fact, with other kinds of massive particles. And under appropriate conditions, you can indeed show that you get the same interference effects. And there's a simple um, quantitative relation between the particle aspect and the wave aspect of these particles, the so-called de Broglie relation. Um, what it does is to take a, um, a, a couple of uh, particle-like properties, say mass and velocity, and relate them to the wavelength of the wave, which uh, describes the particle. Um, and you see uh, the relationship is that the wavelength is uh, h over mv, where h is Planck's constant, 6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Um, however, uh, this raises the question, why don't we see these wavelength properties of things like electrons in everyday life? Um, next slide, please. Well, actually, we can illustrate this with the behavior, not of a massive particle, but of light. Um, light, of course, we normally think of as a wave. However, under certain um, circumstances, <laughs> in fact, many circumstances, it really appears to behave pretty much like a particle. So suppose we have a light wave coming up 
towards a wide aperture um, in, a, in some kind of, sort of opaque screen. And suppose that the wavelength of the light um, is very small compared to the width of the aperture. Then, crudely speaking, the light, the part of the light wave which is opposite the slit, will just go on through it and the rest will be blocked. So, in other words, the light just uh, propagates through the slit just as a set of particles or billiard balls would do. However, if we go to the other extreme, uh, we, where the wavelength of the light is, um, <laughs> or the wavelength of the wave, let's say, sorry, be light, the wavelength of the wave is uh, considerably larger than the dimension of the slit, then we get the phenomenon uh, known as um, diffraction. Um, the wave does not propagate simply forward through the slit, it's also spread out over quite a substantial angle. One illustration of this, um, uh, this transition from uh, particle light to wave-like behavior is exemplified, at least to some extent, this is, is certainly not the whole story, but to some extent is exemplified by the everyday observation that you can hear round a door, but you can't see around it. Uh, why is that? Well, if you're talking about light, um, then the wavelength of light is typically very much, uh, very tiny compared to the size of the door, so it just goes straight through. If on the other hand, you're talking about sound, then the wavelength can easily be of the order of the size of the door or possibly even larger. And so it, it can be diffracted around the door. That's not the whole story. There are other considerations as well, but it's at least part of it. So let's just ask, um, under what conditions, if we have a particle which has a mass of m, um, what conditions do we need to see it beginning to show wave behavior? Well, de Broglie's relation tells us that lambda is h over mv. So, and moreover, to get wave behavior, as you just saw, we need the wavelength larger than the aperture dimension. So, uh, the velocity must be less than the order of h um, divided by the mass times the aperture dimension. Now, if we're talking about, say, the atoms of a gas, then the typical velocities are related to the temperature by the relation a half mv squared is of the order of kt, where uh, k sub b is Boltzmann's constant, 10 to the minus 23 joules per degree, roughly. So putting those considerations together, um, what you find is that if your aperture, and we'll come to the meaning of that in a moment, if your aperture um, has a size of order A, then you need to go down to a temperature of the order of um, less than or of the order of H squared divided by twice the mass times Boltzmann's constant times A squared. Um, now, in a, um, uh, a gas or a liquid or a solid, what should we take to be the typical dimension? Well, a very crude guess would be something like the spacing between particles, because after all, the electron or the atom has to be able to push its way between other atoms. So um, crudely speaking, then, um, we should look at that formula, the boxed formula, and put in for A the, uh, the atomic spacing. Now, that means that, let's just go to the last line for a moment. It turns out that for electrons whose mass is very small, that means that T can really be quite substantial. In fact, electrons will show wave-like behavior in the liquid or solid phase for essentially all temperatures below melting, but, and the, or rather the vaporization um, temperature. So basically, um, under appropriate conditions at, lot, in, at least, electrons in any uh, ordinary solid or liquid do, can show wave-like behavior. Um, on the other hand, suppose we're not talking about electrons, but rather atoms, then uh, the mass is very much larger, which means that the temperature has to be very much smaller. And if you actually put in the numbers, you find that the temperature 
has to be less than or of the order of about 20 degrees absolute divided by the atomic number. Now, that doesn't really give you too many candidates because um, uh, most, uh, first of all, um, most, uh, um, uh, most atoms, as we'll see, um, well, they're, 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 they will actually freeze, and we'll come to why that's important in a moment. But uh, in any case, it means you have to go to very low temperatures if you're talking about anything except maybe um, hydrogen and helium. So the candidates among the among atoms, at first sight at least, the candidates for, for uh, among atoms for to be uh, to form a quantum liquid uh, would include that the temperature has to be below about 20 K. Okay, let's just put that aside for a moment and go on to the third um, the ingredient. And this in some sense is the most interesting and most important, I think. So next slide, please. Okay, why do we need a, um, uh, uh, why do, do we uh, need that atoms should change places? Um, well, uh, first of all, let's let us see, um, could you just go to the next slide for a moment, I think something might be, uh, okay, can go back then, can you go back, thanks, yes, right, fine. Yeah, we'll see in a moment why it's important that, that the um, uh, atoms or electrons should be able to change places, but let's just look at the condition um, for them to do that, first of all. Well, um, in a gas, of course, the uh, atoms do change places quite, uh, quite easily. But on the other hand, in a gas under most conditions, uh, the sort of conditions we were uh, typically used to in the laboratory until a couple of decades ago, um, the temperature was high enough that the de Broglie wavelength, the quantum wavelength of the atoms, was very small compared to the distance between them. So they didn't really form a quantum uh, uh, gas. They, you don't see any wave-like effects. Now, if we look at solid, on the other hand, <laughs> at um, uh, if you get low enough temperatures, um, the uh, atoms are um, uh, they're sort of thick, uh, fairly uh, confined near lattice sides. You can get, you can certainly get the condition that lambda is greater than the distance between the atoms. That's not so difficult. Uh, but on the other hand, in a normal solid, the atoms don't change places. Um, so what we actually need is a system uh, in which, first of all, uh, the temperature is low enough that the de Broglie wavelength is larger than the distance between the atoms, but at the same time, the atoms can um, change places. Um, and that um, happens, um, it doesn't, uh, those conditions are simultaneously fulfilled, if at all, in a liquid, and moreover, um, if you're talking about atoms in a liquid where the temperature is less than about um, 20K. For electrons, the condition again is not so severe. All electrons in all liquid or solid metals um, do change places relatively easily, and they, they do obey the quantum condition. So that's not so bad. But for atoms, you, it really does restrict you a lot. Okay, but I haven't said yet um, why you, are, you, you want to ensure that the atoms uh, can change places. And that's a really rather subtle point, so let's go to the next slide. This involves um, not just uh, quantum mechanics, uh, particles behaving as it waves, but a particular consequence of quantum mechanics, which is that any genuinely, uh, any, any pair of genuinely elementary particles have to be indistinguishable. It's impossible, as it were, to tag an elementary particle and follow its motion. Imagine that we tried to do that with a couple of uh, electrons, say, or neutrons, or uh, whatever. So, well, we could start off by calling one Bob and the other Fred. But now remember that they're going to behave as waves, and therefore they're going to be spread out over a large region, and their position is going to be uh, not terribly well defined. So after a little time, 
you really won't be necessarily very clear um, which is Bob and which is Fred. I mean, it could have been that um, Bob had uh, moved to the right and Fred to the left, as you see in the middle diagram. But equally well, it could have been that you had the bottom diagram in which um, both Bob and Fred keep on their own side. And you simply can't tell which is the case in a, any given physical situation. Now, um, for this, uh, we'll see in a moment uh, what consequences this property has. But um, let me just give one, one um, <laughs> very striking illustration of this, or well, more precisely of the fact that for the, in order for indistinguishability to be important, the particles must be able to change places. And there's a very nice illustration of that, which is actually very, uh, very old. It's been known for um, practically a century, I think. It involves the, um, the, the, the question of uh, the behavior, the rotational and vibrational behavior of a carbon molecule. Um, let's, first of all, if I have a carbon molecule, which is made up of two different isotopes, for example, C12 and C13, then it shows the full spectrum, not just of electronic uh, energy levels, but also of uh, vibrational and rotational energy levels, which quantum mechanics says it should. Um, however, let's suppose we actually have two, uh, and the reason, uh, sorry, I should say, just say, the reason for that is that since these two atoms are actually different, that difference itself is the tag. So it is possible if you've got a C12C13 carbon molecule to tag them as, uh, as one is 12 and one is 13, and you can follow their, their trajectories and so forth. Um, however, let's suppose now that you have a carbon molecule made of two C12s. Then what we find is quite striking we find that the vibrational um, levels are exactly the same, or apart from the, the slight difference in isotopic mass, which we can certainly account for. But apart from that, the behavior of the vibrational levels of a C12, a 2C12 molecule is exactly the same as that of a C12 a C13. However, some of the rotational um, levels are actually missing. So the rotational spectrum is quite different from that of a a C12, C13. Why is that? Well, you see in, um, in the vibrational motion, the, um, the two atoms composing the molecule never change places. In the rotational motion, on the other hand, they obviously do. And so, so it's only if the particles can change places that uh, you, see, you really see the effects of this indistinguishability. And that's why you want not just a quantum system, but a quantum liquid. Okay, let's go on and look at some of the consequences of this indistinguishability. The, uh, what, what it um, tends to um, lead to, or what it does lead to in fact, is so-called quantum statistics. Um, it turns out that you can actually classify elementary particles like um, electrons, neutrons, uh, photons even, uh, into two classes depending on whether the intrinsic spin or intrinsic angular momentum of the particle, which you can think of as a sort of spin motion, rather like a top, which it always has, depends whether that in the appropriate units, which is basically Planck's constant divided by two pi, h bar, um, it depends whether it's even or odd. If the spin is odd, in, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, I said that wrong. It depends on whether it's integral or half integral. If the spin is integral, as it is, for example, for electrons, protons, and neutrons, then uh, you find that the particles have to obey so-called Fermi statistics. Fermions are very xenophobic. They Hate, they, they will not tolerate having more than one particle per state. And so if you go to low enough temperatures, what happens is that the, um, the fermions become degenerate. What that means is that they 
uh, occupy the states of lowest energy, but with only one particle per state. And then you eventually come to uh, the point where you've more or less filled up and you've accommodated all your electrons. And that occurs at an energy which you call the Fermi energy. And it turns out that in a system of uh, fermions, like say the electrons in a normal metal, then uh, all the action takes place near the Fermi energy. But then they're, they're from this point of view, not really terribly interesting. Much more interesting is the other class of particles, which are have um, integral spin in units of h bar. The uh, the most obvious candidate for a boson is actually the photon, but for various reasons um, that really isn't uh, terribly appropriate uh, to form a quantum liquid. However, an even number of particles of odd uh, half, half integral angular momentum, like electrons or neutrons, can actually form a boson. And um, you remember that, um, uh, sorry, let me just give you an example of that. Uh, one example of a um, system of bosons, we believe, is a system of helium-4 atoms. Uh, you remember that the helium-4 atom is actually composed of two um, protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. So that's six fermions, an even number of fermions. So that does behave as a boson. And bosons, as I say, are very different from fermions. Fermions, you remember, are very xenophobic. Bosons, by, by contrast, are extremely gregarious. They would love to have um, more than one particle occupying a different state. And in fact, they love it so much that if you go to low enough temperatures and appropriate densities, then a, um, a, a macroscopic number, that is a finite fraction of all the particles in your, uh, in your experimental cell, will undergo what is called Bose condensation, or BEC. That means that they all, um, or most of them, uh, occupy a single one particle state. And we, we actually have believed for many years, in fact, um, for virtually a century now, that uh, this actually happens in liquid helium-4 below about two degrees absolute. Um, and that, that is the, uh, that is the um, reason for many of the peculiar properties which, the, um, uh, which liquid helium below two degrees absolute uh, uh, possesses. However, we never had any direct experimental evidence that this was happening. Um, about 1996, 95, 96, I guess, um, both condensation was actually realized in a different system of ultra cold atomic gases. You remember I said that, generally speaking, gases are not a candidate for quantum liquids. But there is an exception to that rule. Um, if you can get your gas, um, sufficiently dense and sufficiently cold, then you may be able to get it again to undergo Bose condensation, as we believe happens in helium. And that was actually achieved with a set of um, uh, rubidium-87 uh, atoms yeah, oh, by uh, a group in 1995, and since then there have been lots of other, other experiments. Uh, rubidium-87, you remember, um, is actually a, uh, a boson because um, it's an alkali atom, therefore has an odd number of electrons, but the 87, so it also has an odd number of uh, nucleons. Uh, so it, it should indeed behave as a boson, and indeed it seems to. So what is, what's um, very fascinating about um, bosons when they undergo Bose condensation um, is illustrated in a nice cartoon from the cover of um, Science Magazine in, I think, 1995. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, sorry, I seem to have, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think we just skipped the way the, the um, slide with the algebra. Yep. Yeah, um, 
Okay, so uh, as I say, in 1995, both condensation was achieved in a uh, system of dilute um, atomic, ultra cold atomic gases. And Science uh, Magazine always declares a molecule of the year. And on uh, in this particular year, they declared, declared the molecule of the year to be the Bose condensate. And so they represented the Bose condensate as a set of soldiers all market marching exactly in lockstep. Um, so this uh, illustrates the fact that the atoms which are condensed in the condensate have to all do exactly the same thing at the same time. And you'll notice that there are these other guys which are not in blue, the red and green ones. They're running around basically doing their own thing. And those are the atoms which are not um, in the condensate, but they're not of any particular interest under um, uh, in this particular context. But let me emphasize that this uh, condition that the atoms in the condensate have to all be doing the same thing at the same time, um, th uh, that just doesn't apply to equilibrium states only, it applies to just over all low energy states of the condensate. And as we'll see, that can uh, that can help to explain some of the very peculiar uh, behavior that we see. Okay, next slide, please. Ah, um, okay. Um, how uh, might we actually see Bose con condensation occurring? Um, I mean, how, how, do, how, do the, how do the people in 1995 really know it was occurring? Well, it turns out that these ultra cold atoms uh, um, tend to be trapped in a magnetic or laser um, uh, potential, it's basically a harmonic uh, trap. And in the normal state at um, temperatures above the te uh, temperature of Bose condensation, they uh, you just have a, 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 a sort of Gaussian distribution as in this figure. Now, what would you expect to happen if Bose condensation takes place? Well, if you were talking about a perfectly ideal gas with no interactions, then what would happen is that a large number of these atoms would want to go to the lowest energy state. But the lowest energy state, the so-called um, zero point energy state or ground state, um, has a width in, in this, within this well, which is very tiny compared to this green curve. So it look, so if you had an ideal gas, this is how it would behave. And you'd see a huge peak um, sticking out of the background of the normal, of the, um, the rest of the uh, atoms, the so-called normal component. Um, well, actually, uh, that's a bit of an oversimplification because in fact, it turns out, I said that, that bose, bosons are very gregarious, but they're not, um, as it were, ultra gregarious. I mean, if you push them against one another too hard, they tend to repel one another. Um, just as, you know, um, students, for example, like to get together, but there's clearly a sort of maximum density at which they can reasonably get together. Um, and uh, so, uh, so in fact, that particular configuration would, would cost a lot of energy. So what we actually see is something more like the next slide. Yeah, something more like that. Um, you get a, a peak sticking out of the background. It's just not quite as spectacular as it would do for be for a perfectly ideal gas. Um, and this is something which is routinely uh, observed in experiments nowadays. And I, some, I once or twice have asked my experimental colleagues, um, could I uh, actually see this literally with the naked eye? And their reply is usually, um, well, in principle, you probably could, but I really don't want to have you sticking your eye into the laser beam. So, um, uh, so in fact, it's not terribly practical, but at least in principle, it should be possible to see this with the naked eye. Okay, um, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Yeah, um, how am I doing for time? And let me just unmute myself. Um, you've spent about uh, 35 minutes, um, maybe yeah. 38, something around that time. So okay. don't, don't worry, you have. You, yeah, you have okay. Let me. Yet, so. Yeah, okay. Let me. Um, 
Uh, I think I probably then do have time to just um, uh, discuss this slide, at least briefly. This is a little more technical than most of our slides, but let's go ahead with it. Um, I said that um, uh, that uh, helium-4, uh, once it is in the bose kinetics phase, does display some very peculiar um, characteristics. And here is one of them. It's not the best known one, but it is a very important one. Suppose we put um, helium-4 in an annular container, that's like a circular flower dish, um, and you rotate the walls with a, an angular velocity which is smaller than a characteristic velocity, um, something like h-bar, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, divided by the mass times the radius squared of the, uh, of the annulus. Now, actually, this is a rather small rotational velocity, typically about one revolution per hour, but we can do it. Um, what does the liquid do? Well, experimentally, what we see, and this is the really spectacular thing, is that at room temperature, well, not room temperature, but at, um, at temperatures above the condensation temperature, the liquid pretty much behaves as water would. In other words, it just rotates with the, uh, the container. If you now cool it below the uh, transition temperature to super, the superfluid phase, sorry, I said superfluid, I said both condensed phase, um, it turns out the liquid gradually comes out of equilibrium walls and uh, to all intents and purposes comes to rest in, uh, in the laboratory. Actually, we think it doesn't. It probably actually comes to rest in the frame of the fixed stars but the difference between those is extremely hard to observe. So to all intents and purposes, it comes to rest in the laboratory. And if you heat it, if you now heat it up again, uh, the, um, <laughs> the, it'll gradually come back into rotation with the walls, or part, part of it will. And if you finally heat it above the, the transition temperature, the so-called lambda point, uh, it, it'll just behave like water again. Perfectly reversible effect. Why is it doing this? Well, the general principle is that, uh, this is a very general principle of, of uh, statistical mechanics, the average angular velocity of the atoms must be as close as possible to the rotational velocity of the walls. Um, however, uh, there's a catch. The single atom states must obey a quantization condition and this follows pretty directly from their wave nature. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to represent an atom by a de Broglie wave and fit it in this annular geometry, then the wave must come back to itself once you've gone once around the ring. So that may, means that there must be an integral number of wavelengths in the circumference of the ring, n lambda equals 2 pi r. But in addition, you have the... Um, the Broglie relation, which says that lambda is h over mv. Put those together, you find that the total angular momentum must be quantized in units of h bar, h over 2 pi. Um, that's a, a sort of well known result of quantum mechanics. What that in turn means that the angular velocity of the, more precisely, the average angular velocity of the atoms. Um, must be L divided by the moment of inertia, um, uh, and that uh, may, means that it must be N times this characteristic velocity, omega sub c. Okay, well, if that's so, why don't we see the effect in water at, at room temperature, say? Or indeed, it, just about anywhere else except for liquid helium. Well, it turns out that in a normal, that is not Bose condensed system, Typically, there are many different singular single particle states which are occupied. <coughs> um, the number is something like kT divided by h by omega c to the half, um, which is at least of the order of 10 to the 7 in any reasonable experimental geometry. And so um, you can start off with the, um, with, the atom, with the container at rest and the atoms at rest. And now when you start rotating the container, in order to get the angular velocity of the atoms right, all you need to do is simply to shift the atoms slightly between different states. 
And you can easily show um, this is a sort of technical exercise and statistical mechanics that um, that will uh, uh, just just give you the the trivial common sense behavior that the the atoms just rotate with the container. Um, on the other hand, let's assume we're in a both condensed system, and moreover the temperature is low compared to the transition temperature. Then all or almost all of the atoms must be in the condensate. Um, they must have the same value of uh, in. Um, and uh, that means uh, that uh, the, um, the uh, average value must be some integer times omega c. Uh, but so you have got to get as close as possible to the angular velocity of the, of the container subject to this restriction. So if I now start with the container at rest, then of course the atoms are also at rest. If I now start to rotate the container very slowly, slowly compared to omega sub c, then the, all the atoms have to choose the either all being in the zero, um, uh, zero angular momentum state or all being in the one angular momentum state or, and so on. So what they'll do is in fact to remain in the zero state until I get up to half of omega c, and then they'll all jump up into the um, the uh, L equals one state. Um, and if I go a little further, they'll jump into the L equals two state, et cetera, et cetera. And one very amusing consequence of this is that when the angular velocity of the container is between a half omega c and omega c, then the atoms will actually be rotating faster than the container. And that behavior is essentially seen experimentally, although the experiment is more complicated than this. The experiment is certainly consistent with this, uh, uh, this fundamental prediction. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, I think it's probably going to be my, uh, my final topic. Um, uh, final, um, of course, one of the most uh, spectacular effects which can occur at uh, low temperature nowadays up to quite a, a decent fraction of room temperature is uh, superconductivity. What does that mean? Well, suppose I take a circuit, an electrical circuit, um, which is composed partly of some ordinary metal, like say copper, and then partly, that's the blue bit, by some um, uh, metal which is going to become a superconductor at low temperatures, uh, let's say uh, aluminum. Uh, and I pass, I, I drive a, um, uh, a, a fixed current, A, um, through the circuit. Uh, well, a voltage, typically a voltage will uh, develop um, across any part of the circuit, in particular it will develop across the, uh, the aluminum, the blue bit. And um, typically that uh, voltage is proportional to the current, and of course by good old Ohm's law, we define the resistance to be the ratio of the two. And that seems to work pretty well. And we can plot the resistance as a function of temperature. But if we do this experiment with aluminum, we find that at room temperature, it has a, uh, some kind of standard resistance, nothing particularly remarkable. If I lower the temperature, um, then the uh, resistance will decrease. But then quite suddenly, at a temperature somewhere close to one degree, the resistance will form, dis fall discontinuously to zero. And this effect was discovered by Kamerling Onis, or uh, actually more, um, more precisely by his lab, lab assistant uh, in uh, 1911. And it's been very well known just since then. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is just a, uh, for, for amusement. The, um, uh, this plots the highest temperature at which superconductivity has been uh, observed experimentally as a function of time. And you see that it starts off at 1911, uh, that was mercury at about four degrees absolute. This is the temperature, as the time goes on, the temp highest temperature has increased. And by the spring of 1986, it had gone up to a bit, bit over 20 degrees. Um, and then things really went completely wild. Um, it was found to zoom up to something like 125, 150 degrees, 
And in fact, now, um, this is the point which I plotted in 2014, the highest transition temperature right now is pretty much room temperature, actually, with one huge proviso. You only get this very um, high transition temperature to the superconducting state in a particular, well, a set, a set of compounds, um, the metal sulfides, uh, uh, at a under a pressure of um, several hundred gigabars. So um, that's not that's not normal conditions at all. So these are not, as it were, everyday objects. But nevertheless, uh, superconductivity is now attained pretty close to room temperature. Um, maybe, and I would think that actually the probability of this is more than 50%. I would think in your lifetime, we quite likely are going to have a robust superconductivity under not only room temperature, but room pressure. Uh, but that's the case. Anyway, let's just, uh, what I would like to just do, indicate briefly, is uh, why uh, the sort of quantum liquid behavior that I've uh, tried to discuss in this lecture uh, helps to explain uh, superconductivity. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, yeah, well, I've, I've already been through that, uh, uh, but there is one important point. Um, a compound object consisting of an even number of fermions has the even spin as a boson, therefore can, can undergo both condensation, at least in a sense. Uh, so let's go on. Next slide, please. Yep. Okay. So, um, so we believe that in some sense, what happens when a metal goes superconducting are that pairs of electrons get together to form some kind of boson. Now, you might think that what happens is that the electrons actually get very close together and they form a sort of dielectronic molecule whose size is small compared to the distance between the different molecules. It's possible that um, that uh, happens in some kinds of superconductor, the so-called, for example, the so-called high temperature cuprate superconductors. People argue about that. It's, it's not what happens in a, a standard old-fashioned superconductor. What happens in a standard old-fashioned superconductor was that the pairs of electrons are so-called Cooper pairs. That is, they form at distances which are very large compared to the typical distance between electrons. So those two guys with the red circles around them are forming a Cooper pair. But you see that between them, there are any number of other uh, electrons which are all forming their own pairs and doing their own thing. So it's a very strongly um, uh, collective phenomenon. Now, a, uh, uh, the theory of this, which is generally believed to describe rather well, at least the old fashioned superconductors like say um, aluminum or lead or tin, that theory was actually developed by my um, former colleagues, by Dean Schiff, Cooper and Schiefer here at the University of Illinois in 1957. Um, and one, uh, one striking consequence of this theory is that once these Cooper pairs are formed, they automatically undergo both condensation. And therefore, they must all exactly do exactly the same thing at the same time. And that's true not just in an equilibrium, but also in a non equilibrium situation. So, um, how, how does this explain the phenomenon of superconductivity? Well, let's think about I thought a uh, experiment which is occasionally done, but it's not the most common type of experiment. I take a superconducting ring um, uh, in the superconducting state, so at low temperatures, and I um, I start off, let us say, with a non-zero magnetic flux, and then I turn the magnetic flux down to zero. Well. Um, as you know, a, a, a magnetic flux which is changing in time gives rise to an electric field or an EMF, in this case to an EMF around the ring. So I'll get a sort of pulse of EMF, and that will generate a current. Now in a normal metal, if, if the, the ring is, is uh, in the normal state, at room temperature say, then what's going to happen is that the moment the pulse comes off, that um, uh, that uh, circulating current is going to, to die away. Um, and it'll it may take some a little time to do so, but 
it will go away. And you can there's a nice little experiment which illustrates that. So you can take, say, a copper tube and you take a little magnet and drop it down the tube. And what happens is that the magnet generates a, a, a circulating, it's pulled down by gravity, but it generates a circulating current and uh, that current tends to hold the magnet back from dropping, but eventually it will drop. And I've done this experiment many times at uh, uh, demonstrations and it typically takes a few seconds to drop, drop through the, the tube. But whatever your geometry, it will in the end die away. That's not what happens in a superconductor. In a superconductor, once you start the current flowing, um, it'll continue essentially forever. Um, so how do we understand this? Well, um, think of, let's take an analogy. Suppose that um, we consider a forest, I mean a natural forest, not a plantation, where the trees are just distributed at random. Then I take a, a set of school kids and I just instruct them to run through the forest. I don't give them any other special instructions. Well, eventually, um, uh, one of the kids is going to run up against a tree. So she will swerve to avoid it, but she has no special instructions. So having, uh, having swerved, she'll just go running on in, off in the new direction. And after a little time, the um, uh, the the, uh, the kids will just be running in all sorts of random directions. There'll be no coherent motion. And that's something what, like what happens in a normal metal. I start off the electrons at the left of the diagram, all running in the same direction. But now there are um, impurities, which are the analog of the trees in the forest. And um, uh, every now and again, an electron will run up against an impurity. And it'll be deflected by it, be scattered. And it has, as it were, no special instructions. So it'll just move off in the new direction. And after a rather short time, all my electrons will, will be running in random directions and I'll have no current. So that's what's happening in the, in the copper uh, tube and, and so on. But now let's uh, think about a platoon of soldiers. The platoon of soldiers, oh damn. Um, the, the, uh, you have a platoon of soldiers and uh, they are uh, also instructed to march into the forest, but they are instructed that they must all try as best they can to keep in step. So uh, again, sooner or later, some soldier is going to run up against a tree and he's going to swerve to avoid it. However, he knows that he has to keep in step with his colleagues, his, co his comrades. So having avoided the tree, he will probably rapidly drop back into step um, and uh, uh, they will go on in the same direction. And this will happen repeatedly with other um, soldiers. And after a, even after a long time, the platoon of soldiers will still be marching on coherently as one, one body. And crudely speaking, that's what happened to the group of pairs in the superconductor. Um, eventually one pair or perhaps one electron of the pair will indeed run up against an impurity, but, um, it, and it'll be scattered uh, momentarily by the uh, impurity, but again, it, as it were, has the instructions, it has to keep in, 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 uh, in step with all the other Cooper pairs. And so it drops back into step, and even after a long, long time, the, um, the, the uh, pairs will still be going in the same direction. In other words, the current will just exactly be the same as it started off. You get no decay of the current. And that's a very, it's actually a very um, spectacular effect. Um, in the very early days of superconductivity, um, there was a, a famous demonstration experiment in which Camelingonis, who's the only person in those days whose lab could get superconductivity, created a current in a ring um, in his laboratory in Leiden. He put it in a dewar, he flew it across the North Sea and exhibited it at the Royal Society in London. The current was still flowing. Nowadays, we, we know that the lifetime of the current under most conditions is much, much longer than the age of the universe. So very spectacular effect. Well, I could go on and uh, there are other uh, spectacular examples of the same principle, but I think probably I've got to the time where I, I should perhaps stop and allow time for any questions that you have.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. It was a very, very interesting talk, and there are quite a few questions um, from people on YouTube, uh, at the very least, um, and people here on the Zoom. Um, if you raise your hands, um, I may also call upon you if you'd like to either give a, if you'd like to give a question um, verbally, alternatively write it in the chat. So um, the very first question that I have was someone was asking um, regarding um, this coherent behavior, whether that requires communication, and if so, whether um, how that gets around the fact that no communication can happen uh, faster than the speed of light. Um, well, uh, luckily it doesn't have to um, for most of the um, phenomena I'm discussing. Um, that may not be, as it were, a sort of trivial statement forever, because um, one thing I think is very likely to happen sometime in the next um, few decades is that um, there will be a uh, global superconducting um, network set up um, uh, so that uh, uh, basically the um, super uh, there'll be a, a set of superconducting wires um, which will link um, for example, a, a laboratory in London to a laboratory in Tokyo, um, uh, Washington, D.C., or wherever. Um, it, it doesn't exist now, as I say it may, um, sometime in the not-so-far-distant future. And under those conditions, uh, you do have to worry about um, the finite uh, speed of propagation of light. Um, if you wanted to do some experiment, for example, which uh, involved measuring things on a time scale very, very small, uh, microsecond or so, then most certainly you'd have to worry about finite propagation velocities. Most of the experiments which are done on superconductors right now are not of that nature, and therefore you don't usually have to worry. But, but indeed, in principle, as your, the question has pointed out, you should. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then we have a, as uh, this was a question by Claire, I should just say. Um, then we have a question uh, by Apinov, um, who's asking regarding um, mixtures of liquids. Could you have like droplets of, say, a Bose Einstein condensate and some other kind of quantum liquid? And what kind of behaviors would you have if you had sort of a mixed, mixed oh. base? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, the simple answer is yes, <laughs> you can and do. Um, and in fact, for probably five or six decades now, um, we have had uh, in the laboratory, people have, have had uh, mixtures of um, helium-4 um, and helium-3. Now, actually, both of those uh, liquids individually are um, superfluid, um, but but only under very good different conditions. So if I, for example, sit at a temperature of um, say, oh, I don't know, a tenth of a degree, that is very much below the Bose condensation temperature of helium-4, and therefore it does behave as a, as a superfluid, but it's way above the condensation temperature of helium-3, which is way down at a milli-degree. So the helium-3 behaves in a quite normal way. But nevertheless, these uh, mixtures do have very interesting uh, properties, and lots and lots of uh, experiments have, um, have been done on them. And uh, oddly enough, since you asked the question, this was in fact the topic of my own PhD thesis, or the Phil thesis, uh, way, way back in, I'm trying to remember the year, it's was, uh, it was actually 1964. <laughs> uh, it, it, part of my thesis was on, on mixtures of, of helium-4 and, and helium-3. And nowadays, there are lots of other examples. Um, in, for example, in the alkali gases, you can have uh, mixtures of two, two different fermion gases, mixtures of two different boson gases, and a mixture of a uh, boson and a fermion. And the, the just, it's a field, oh, it's, it's an odd, odd situation. Um, in many areas of physics, at least um, traditionally, uh, there have been a lot of theory and not 
really enough experiments to test the theory. In the ultra cold alkyl gases, it's basically the other way around. The, the theory is rather straightforward, and there's basically an infinite number of experiments one can do. Um, so, in some sense, the art of being a good experimental physicist when working on ultra cold atomic gases is knowing which of these infinitely many experiments to choose, which of them are significant and which of them are not. Yeah, so, um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> that's that's a very very in-depth answer and quite the coincidence that happened uh to be something you you'd specifically worked on in your phd thesis what was do you recall what your phd thesis was on um the, the whole title if this was yeah, just a uh, sure. small part uh, uh sure um exactly in two parts um one of them uh the first half of my thesis was on the behavior of interacting phonons in in superfluid liquid helium-4 and in solids, um, mm -hmm. in insulating solids. And basically, um, I had seen a paper in the literature, um, which I think from someone at Queen Mary College, um, which uh, had looked at how you do the theory of colliding phonons when the uh, energy and momentum conditions can't be quite satisfied, but are very nearly satisfied. And the author had uh, had tried to, to uh, figure out how if you took the finite line width of the phonons into account, um, you might be able to, um, uh, to still get some, uh, some so-called forbidden collision. So I basically tried to extend that work. Um, the other half of the thesis was on the mixtures. Now, in those days, the phase diagram had not been completely explored. And it was known that phase separation did take place at low enough temperatures. But what was not clear was whether if you went to, to very low temperatures, essentially zero temperature, whether a finite um, fraction of helium-3 would be stable in, in helium-4, or vice versa, whether a, very, a finite fraction of helium-4 would be stable in majority helium-3. Um, I guess wrong. I, I worked <laughs> on on uh, on very dilute solutions of helium four in helium three. Well, I've, I've, unfortunately, eventually it turned out that on that side of the phase diagram, the coexistence curve hits the axis. In other words, at zero temperature, no helium four is stable in helium three, whereas on the other side, uh, about ten percent of helium three is stable in helium four. So had I chosen the other side of the phase diagram, I think my thesis <laughs> might, might have made a bit more of an impact. <laughs> I see, I see. It's it's really, really um, powerful how, how such small decisions can like completely, completely <laughs> change the, the course of research. Um, we have someone who's asking um, regarding um, um, these macroscopic uh, coherent phases whether we can observe um, quantum commutation relations in, say, the angular momentum. Um, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by that, but can we observe any effects of the commuta uh, of the non-commutation, rather, of the angular momentum? In, um... Yeah. Yeah, that's a rather delicate point. Um, you have to remember that um, when you, I think the phrase macroscopic, um, uh, macroscopic quantum systems or whatever, uh, can be a little confusing. Normally, what you're uh, talking about is a uh, system which is believed to occur in um, helium-4 in the Bose condensed phase or, or the, as I discussed in, in uh, the uh, pairs of electrons in metals um, in the superconducting phase. What happens there is that you have a whole lot of, of microscopic quantities, for example, helium-4 atoms. You have a macroscopic number of those, those microscopic quantities, and they're all behaving in the same way. Um, that's one, one use of the word macroscopic. But if that's all that's happening, then, generally speaking, I mean, you can write down, sure, you can write down computational relations for the angular momentum. But if you just stare at that, you can see that the um, that on the one, one side, 
you have these two um, quantities, for example, L sub X and L sub Y. And on the other side, you have a single angular momentum, say L sub Z. Um, so as you increase the number of particles, uh, all these uh, LX, LY, and LZ all create, um, grow proportionately. So the left-hand side of your equation goes as n squared, and the right-hand side of your equation just goes as n. And that means that sufficiently large n, the, um, commutation, the commutator of your two quantities becomes negligible compared to the actual value of the quantities in question. Um, so under those conditions, no, you don't um, uh, normally see um, effects of that. However, there are some rather special conditions where you can, and that is, again, that actually, amazingly, that's something on which I spent quite a bit of my own research career, simply trying to figure out when you could see that, this kind of effect in a system like a superconductor. As I say, it doesn't just happen um, without you doing anything, but if you, um, if you uh, build your system in the right way, under the right conditions, with the right purity, et cetera, yes, you can see them and do see it. And in fact, that's been a major topic of research over the last 20 years. And it's the basis for the use of superconducting devices as so-called qubits in a quantum computer, in fact. Okay. That was really, really insightful. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more question. And then after that, if anyone would like to ask, I think probably the final question. So we have this one. And then if anyone would like to ask <laughs> the final question, um, okay. then um, uh, JLI, I don't know what their name is, is asking um, regarding your uh, what is your view on the theory of uh, high temperature um, superconductivity, um, which is rather rather broad? But do you have any <laughs> any kind of insights? Well, I think I have a rather simple answer. It doesn't exist. <laughs> At least not <laughs> right now. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. There are. Um, I think a fair uh, a fair summary of the situation is that probably. If you, if you go to a dozen theorists who've thought about, uh, thought seriously about high temperature superconductivity, uh, you, will, you can ask any one of these dozen theorists, um, uh, do we understand uh, high temperature superconductivity? And they will nod and say, yes, sure, we do. And then you say, well, what is the explanation? And each one of them will give you a different explanation. So, um, so really, I think we, uh, the answer is we, do, we don't have a proper theory. Um, I think myself that the way to go forward, uh, a, a useful way to try to go forward is to isolate not a very generic question like how do high temperature superconductors work, but some much more specific questions like, um, for example, can we get a simple phenomenological description of the, the um, macroscopic electromagnetic properties of the high temperature superconductors, similar to what we have for the old fashioned ones? And the answer to that seems to be yes, and we have developed such a thing. Um, or example, or something I've myself been quite involved in, can we, say, can we find out from experiment and, and the necessary theory something about the nature of the Cooper pair order parameter and in particular its symmetry. That is, in some sense, the, uh, the shape of the relative order parameter of the two electrons. Again, the answer, uh, I think most people would agree, is, is yes, we can. Uh, those don't give you a theory, but they at least give you some constraints which an eventual theory has to satisfy. In the same way that uh, BCS um, had a lot of thermodynamic and transport properties to, to work with, when they formulated their theory, right? Well, uh, that, that exactly, yeah, exactly so. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. Okay. That that was also very insightful. Then we have um, a, one. The final question will then be from an entirely different point of view, and more about about your personal life, and particularly um, your education, because uh, you started out not studying physics. You started Correct. out studying classics. Um, Correct. Yeah. Um, how did you come to study physics, uh, or how did you come to do physics after studying classics? <laughs> well, it's a long story, but let me try to give you essentials. Um, I was very unimaginative, very naive, um, very immature. Um, <laughs> when I, um, well, as I came toward the end of my career, uh, my undergraduate degree in uh, classics, it actually wasn't, uh, it, it was more than classics. It was, um, 
as, uh, well, uh, you're Cambridge, right? <laughs> I'm Oxford, <laughs> so you don't have a great degree in Cambridge, but uh, I expect you know what it is. Uh, uh, basically, mm -hmm. you do uh, languages and literature for the first um, five trimesters, and then an equal mix of uh, ancient history, ancient men, Greek and Roman, and philosophy for the last seven trimesters. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, so as I was coming to the end of my four years, it began to occur to me that uh, eventually I was going to have to do something for which someone else would pay me. <laughs> and the, as I say, I was um, uh, naive and uh, immature, and the only Thing I could think of doing was going on into an academic career, and my first thought was to go was to go on to a career in philosophy. I gradually decided I didn't want to do that, and I started to try to think why. Um, and I eventually came up with the answer that it was um, because you never seem to have any kind of external. Uh, if you're a professional philosopher, you don't really have any kind of external touchstone for whether what you're doing is good or bad. You just have to rely on your basically your colleagues' opinions about that. I wanted to something uh, where I had an external touchstone for whether my theories or whatever were right or wrong. Uh, and I eventually came to the conclusion that physics was that kind of subject. And that was how I decided to try to get into it. The process of actually getting into it is another story. It was quite complicated. And I was very, very lucky. There were lots and lots of bits of serendipity which helped me do that. But I said, that's, that's another story. That would take another 15 minutes or so. <laughs> Fair enough. No, that, that's quite intriguing. How, um, so I guess, how did you come to study classics in the first place? Um, oh, that, the answer to that is very, very straightforward. Uh, I entered high school um, at, uh, in 1948, uh, uh, I guess, 1948, um, maybe 1947, at the age of nine or 10. Um, oh, wow. I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do in life or what my interests were. Um, my father was a was actually a school teacher who included in, in his subjects physics, but he never put any kind of pressure on me to to go into that, in that direction. At that, uh, we're talking about the late forties. Um, at that time, the uh, very different, def, definite sort of intellectual pecking order. Um, the uh, at the the um, very bottom, you had science. Uh, slightly more respectable was mathematics. A little more respectable than that was history and modern languages and so forth. And finally, um, oh, um, uh, right, oh, mathematics is somewhere down near science at the bottom. <laughs> uh, right at the top, there was classics. Um, uh, Greek, the study of Greek and Latin uh, languages and uh, perhaps to some extent uh, uh, literature. And so, as I say, I had no particular feelings otherwise, and so that's where I ended up, basically. Um, it, was sim it simply was the prestige subject in those days. That uh, changed, of course, uh, rather yes. dramatically in 1957 would... when Sputnik was up. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. That was, that was the reason for the change, because I was just about to say, these days, uh, it's all about the, the STEM subjects, and anyone who's not in STEM yeah. is... Uh, not doing a, a proper subject and won't get a proper career out of it, um, which <laughs> no, I think right, we, we yeah. might have gone with, gone a bit too far in, in the other direction these days. Um, that's that's yeah. perhaps a subject for another time. Thank you so much for all of these questions. It's it's really, really good to, um, your answers are really well thought out and well communicated. I, I learned a lot, um, especially in, in the talk, really liked your, um, the part about why it needs to be a quantum liquid rather than the gas, because huh. I don't think anyone really pointed that out to me before. Even it's quite quite weird to me why we were always talking about spin liquids or Bose-Einstein condensation mm -hmm. as a liquid and things like that. But that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, uh, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, depending on if you if you have anywhere you need to go, um, I think now would be a good. Um, end point if you don't have anywhere to go at the moment would like to stay for, for a little chat for another 15 minutes or so I think it makes sense to end the official part of the talk 
and then um, perhaps just have a more casual conversation. Okay, but um, just tell me, well, I'm sorry, I don't have easy access to, to a watch. What, what is the time? The time is currently 23 past, um, well, I don't know what it will be, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 23 okay. past uh, eight. So it's an uh, hour so and 23 minutes after the start. Okay. So it's 23 minutes past two on the side of the, uh, in, in my neck of the woods in, in Illinois. So, um, uh, yeah, actually, it's more, more of my talk if anyone wants to see it. But, um, it, uh, but anyway, I do have something at three o'clock, uh, which I have to do, but, that, but I'm going to be sitting here. So I'll tell you what, why don't you just give me, give me two minutes. Uh, I just need to pop out of the room for a couple of minutes, and then yeah. uh, I'll come back, and if, if people want to chat informally, they can do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Fantastic. I'll take off my headphones and uh, I just uh, yeah. Uh,